normal. All right, the chamber pressure looks good. Drop right now. Water towers can fly! Yes! Ego down to nominal. Water down to SCE dog. Bring it, SCE dog. Yikes. You bet. Okay. We don't need any more of these. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to NASA Spaceflight Live, our weekly news show where we're going to talk about all of the latest spaceflight news from around the world and answer your questions live, a live interactive show so we can discuss everything that's happening these days. Uh, my name is Thomas Burkhart, news director for NASA Spaceflight. Thank you all for tuning in. I'm not alone on NSF Live, of course. We've got Ian Atkinson, writer for NASA Spaceflight, with us as well. Ian, how are you doing today? Doing great, Thomas. Glad to be here. Been a little while, but glad to be back on. Oh, always a pleasure having you on, Ian. Uh, also, Adrian Bile back on the show. Adrian, how you doing? I'm doing fantastic as well. It's always great to be on this show. Yeah, thank you both for hopping on, uh, and thank you everyone who's tuned in. We've got a lot to talk about this week. Uh, we've got some Chinese spaceflight news that may you may have been tracking over the weekend. We'll deep dive into the Changzhang 5B rocket scenario. Uh, we're also going to give some updates on Relativity Space, who's getting ready to get in their first orbital launch attempt with the Terran 1 rocket. Uh, also, some updates on the Mars Sample Return Program with NASA and the European Space Agency. Some really cool announcements there. Uh, some new International Space Station news involving the Russian Space Agency as well, and of course all the latest from the Starship program down in Starbase, Texas. Um, and of course throughout the show we're going to be taking as many questions as we can. So if you've got questions about what we're talking about, go ahead, tag us at NASA Spaceflight. I'm going to pull as many of those questions in over the course of the show as I can, and uh, we'll do our best to answer them because we want this to be a live and interactive show. So uh, thank you all for in advance for sending questions, and I look forward to seeing those. But let's dive into our first topic for today, which is the Chengzhang 5B rocket, which just launched China's second space station module. Adrian, I want to start with you because you are our most involved Chinese spaceflight reporter these days, and you've been following this very closely, I know. So tell us all about what we were watching over this past weekend. Yeah, so uh, what we watched is uh, something that has sadly become common after Long March or Changzhang 5B launches, which uh, is the uh, dropping of the sustainer, the, the middle stage of the rocket, which every time these these rocket setup launches is uh, coming back to Earth un uh, without any control. That comes down to the design of Changzheng 5B, which uh, is a uh, is a uh, has a, like this big Hydrolox core stage and the four RP1 boosters on the side. And that core stage is not a first stage that then is followed by a second stage. Mm -hmm. This first stage is basically the last stage that also performs, like it's a sustainer stage that just ignites on the ground. So it brings, it goes to a very, very high altitude, which happened here as well. And the, uh, the Chinese uh, space program apparently didn't include any ways to deorbit this com in, a, in a controlled manner. They are, uh, made statements in the past that they have no interest to implement that and kind of shifted it like, okay, that's just normal and we don't want to do that. Um, yeah, and uh, basically this then always turns out into this huge stage watch that happens all over Twitter and everyone. I mean, you, you probably saw a lot of tweets from Jonathan McDowell, for example, that was just tracking this. And yeah, it's kind of unpredictable where this comes down. It could come down everywhere. It always depends on how the stage is turning, how it is uh, facing into the atmosphere. And I mean, even one hour before, there were predictions that said it could get, come down over the U.S. or about uh, over South Asia. It was kind of like we didn't know until an hour. So yeah, welcome to uh, Shangzheng 5B, every time. Yeah, and that differentiates. There's two Shangzheng 5 variants, and the other variant doesn't have this problem, right? No, because it has an upper stage. Uh, but the, the, the 5B is kind of the brute force approach for them to launch these very high, um, high, pay, uh, high weight payloads to LEO, like space station modules. It is, I think right now, the third, uh, third uh, biggest rocket operational in the world after Falcon Heavy and Delta IV Heavy, if I'm not informed. So it's a very big rocket. It's not, it's, it's not a small, small one, and especially these modules are big. So they're kind of brute forcing it with these huge cores and like just getting them into Leo. 
And that is this 5B variant, which is uh, deleting the second stage and just gives this, this center core power and brings it to orbit. And this is only the second flight of that variant, right? Because it's only been used for the two station modules? Uh, it is the third flight of this variant, uh, if I am if I recall correctly. But yes, it, it also launched the um, core module, which is... Uh, which uh, happened last year and also had the same issue. Like we right. had the same discussion with the same topics there as well. And it also launched a next generation crewed spacecraft in 2020. Oh, okay. um, I'm sadly not sure if that discussion was already a thing there, but I remember it from the, from the uh, Tianhe uh, core module. There was a big discussion there as well. And uh, this time, as well as last time, it seems like it came down without any like impact or like without anybody getting injured which is good but mm. of course that is kind of due to luck right like this is this is not because somebody made precautions it's just it came over the ocean but it could like there is scenarios where this comes over down over for example the us there is paths that go over the us right it's when you i mean if you were to just take a a projectile and throw it, you know, at a reentry profile. Odds are it's going to hit the ocean just because that covers most of the Earth's surface. But the space programs here in the United States and in Europe and even Russia, on the vast majority of the time, those stages are either actively deorbited into a specific spot in the ocean. In fact, there's a name for it, the Point Nemo, which is the, like most remote part of the Pacific Ocean, which is where we try to deorbit as much of our. Uh, things as possible. Sometimes it's a different part of the ocean. Um, or it's designed so that it will completely disintegrate upon reentry. So no matter where it re-enters, none of it's going to reach the ground. When you have a giant core stage like this Changzheng 5B, um, that that is almost certainly going to survive reentry. It's too big to be completely disintegrated. And uh, China doesn't target the reentry point. It just naturally decays out of low Earth orbit. Um, and of course, NASA has actually directly responded to this. This is the statement from Bill Nelson, basically saying that, you know, spacefaring civilizations have, there are standards for these things. The United States, Europe, Russia even, have certain procedures that they've been following for years. And it's not um, unfair to be asking China to do the same. China has, of course, not not faced any serious consequences for this because the last two flights have happened to come down over the ocean. Is there any sort of architecture for, like, if, if something were to happen, if, say, this debris landed in Texas, what what repercussions are there from that? I would think it would be a pretty major diplomatic fallout because that is, like, I, I would imagine major pushback from the US to follow if that if some of these debris come over, for example, over the US. Um, the question always is like, how do we enforce any change? Like mm -hmm. the US is trying and, and the and uh, the EU as well, they are trying to enforce a change right now and it's not happening. And I don't see any indication that this will be, for example, fixed on the next flight, which is that not that far off anyway, because we will probably experience this again in later this year, where they launched the uh, second science module, uh, mm -hmm. Mengtian, where, which also launched on the same rocket configuration. It will launch to the same incl uh, uh, inclination, the same height. This will happen again. If they didn't change anything, that will happen again. And no indication so far is that they, they will change. And I only see it change if there's like a major diplomatic push. And even then, will have like what's what's what are your leverages like mm -hmm. what how how would you change it and well i mean that's yeah well let's think about this too i mean just hypothetically how what is the solution to this do you use like could what could these modules be launched on the other long much five variant and use the upper stage so that the first stage can be left in the suborbital trajectory and have a targeted re-entry point or is it, it not up is that literally not a performance possibility it's kind of hard to always guess with the five, but this module was kind of like this rocket configuration was made for these modules. Mm -hmm. They're really made for this. So I would expect that this rocket configuration is the goal to launch this until the big, next bigger ones, uh, which also is a long March 5, um, is coming up. 
then then they have alternatives that might not push the performance. But even then, we are. I think it's not a performance problem here. I don't I don't see a like a situation here where they say we couldn't do this. It's more like they didn't bother because deorbiting a rocket stage doesn't cost you like tons. Right. It, Plus you well, a couple kilograms, you know, of propellant, yeah, like, right? You need some thrusters. You need some way to to influence the orbit a bit. Even even not that much. In a in a in this slow decay scenario, you could still basically close to the end fire it and make sure, okay, we are coming down now. But mm -hmm. it, it doesn't require that much weight. It's more that they didn't really bother. So I don't see this I, I, if this will be fixed, then it will be with a bigger rocket. And they are not fixing this because they they then can fix it. It's more than that. It's just didn't come up as an issue there. Ian, what are your thoughts on this on the changing five B situation? I mean, like, because this is exactly what the rocket was designed for. This is not the first time it's happened. This is not the last time it will happen. Um, and you were talking about it coming over the United States. That reminded me. I'm not sure if it was back when it launched Tian Hei last year, the module, or launched the. Tianzu, Tianzhou, um, resupply spacecraft, but there was um, a time when the rocket was about to re-enter that it flew directly over Central Park in New York City, and 30 minutes after that, it burned up over Africa. If it had landed 30 minutes earlier, there could have been a significant loss of life from just the debris. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's sad to see it just not being cared about, really. Um, and yeah, I mean, this is also not the first time that a rocket configuration like this has happened. While you're talking, it reminded me of uh, the Russians, uh, it's the Soviets back in the fifties and sixties with their R7 rocket. The core of that was launched into low earth as the sustainer. Um, the Atlas boot that launched the Mercury spacecraft, the Atlas booster was launched into orbit as a sustainer. All of those were in orbit for a few weeks before coming back. And even Skylab, Skylab and the second stage that it launched on, um, my audio got super quiet. Uh, but uh, even like the second stage that Skylab launched on was uncontrolled. Uh, Skylab burned up uncontrolled. So th this is not the first time it's happened. Probably not the last time it will happen either. Um, so hopefully this will be a bigger concern because we can see there, it is burning up over people. Like the, the, the video that we saw from this reentry uh, yesterday or two days ago, people were able to record it. It flew over their heads. So I think that like, it should be taken into consideration. It should be a serious priority um, uh, to look into this. Right, sure. And we've got a bunch of questions coming in, so let's bring these into the discussion here as well. Um, one question here, and this is a good one. SLS also has a... Oh, hold on. Actually, I'm going to precede oh, I'm going to precede this with a different question because it makes more sense to go in this order. TJ is asking what the meaning of a sustainer stage is. Um, so, Adrian, you called the core stage a sustainer stage and want to go into detail just quickly what that means with, in, in context of these larger rockets? Yeah, you have to basically... SLS is another good example here because... Like the the core stage for uh, Long March Five and the core stage, for example, also for SLS, they are not really doing the heavy lifting lifting at liftoff. It's the side boosters that are more the first stage here. They are really doing the push, the the liftoff. They are more sustainer stages are more stages that are lit on the ground, and then perform their majority of their work later in the flight and go for a longer time. They are not like, for example, the Falcon Nine first stage, which who does the lifting at the beginning and also decouples pretty quick and pretty low. If you just compare Falcon 9 first stage to, for example, a Long March 5 first stage, the Falcon 9 first stage barely goes downrange like, what, 600 kilometers? And this made turns around the Earth for but days. But it reached orbit. <laughs> yeah, it, reached, it was in orbit. It was, a, it was an orbital it, long for five, four, four, five days, which is very different. It's much faster, it burns much longer, and it's kind of only a, yeah, kind of a second stage lit on the ground-ish. I would rephrase it, like something like that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that so that differs from well, 
Yeah, so, so this is talking about the sustainer stage that burns longer. That's a first stage, but it, like you said, it differs from a stage that's more, think of maybe as a booster, where you look at like the Atlas V first stage or the Falcon 9 first stage that are higher thrust. Um, so the follow-up question that I was going to go with is, SLS is also a large sustainer stage. What makes SLS less dangerous than the Chinese rocket? So the difference here is that the flight profile for SLS, when that large sustainer stage shuts down, it's still on a suborbital trajectory. And the way they do that is they find it a very elliptical trajectory. So at, at main engine cutoff on Artemis 1, and the flight profile is different for slightly different missions, but for Artemis 1, the apogee is like 1,800 kilometers, which is like beyond low Earth orbit. That's like a medium Earth orbit um, altitude. But the perigee, the lowest point of the orbit, is still it's like 50 kilometers or something, which is like with, which is within the atmosphere. So on that first orbit, the core stage will re-enter, and they know exactly where that will take place. It's like in I think it's in the Indian Ocean. Um, it will come down in a very specific area. They will put out a hazard zone that says that will make sure that that area is clear at the time of launch and during the time that it will re-enter, um, and it will disintegrate safely over the ocean. So anything that does survive will impact an unpopulated area. Um, that is the responsible way to fire a long sustainer stage. Um, other rockets that are kind of can be thought of as sustainer stages, the core stages of the Ariane rockets, so Ariane 5 and Ariane 6, are both very long burning stages. They're paired with big, powerful boosters, just like SLS and Chengzheng 5B, um, that provide a lot of extra thrust to get the rocket off the ground. But then once the boosters separate, you are left with a more efficient but lower thrust burning engine. Um, the SLS engines are those Hydrolox RS-25s, which are relatively high thrust, but when you put them on a giant rocket, the thrust to weight ratio is actually not super big. Um, and then same, very similar deal with the Ariane rockets. And again, they fly the trajectory so that the upper stage does the final orbital insertion so that the core stage can render on a suborbital trajectory and render in a predictable and safe manner. The Chang'e 5B, by deleting that upper stage, the core stage has to go into orbit. And once you're in orbit and you're not actively maneuvering, it is not easy to predict when the when and where the reentry will take place, which is why over the weekend we were following groups like the Aerospace Corporation, which is a it's not technically a nonprofit, but it's like a, a consulting company um, that's not really for profit per se. There's a specific word for it, and I'm forgetting the actual category they fall under. Uh, but Aerospace Corporation, the European Space Agency, or and some agency within Europe was also very much tracking it, and then the U.S. Space Force as well, all have their different models of reentry, and they kind of converged upon the same point eventually. But those predictions have a lot of variance in them, because it's when you have a stage that's like tumbling in orbit, there was even some videos of the stage, like you could see it like blinking, because as it was tumbling in orbit, it was more and less reflective. Um, so a tumbling stage in low Earth orbit does not come down on a predictable trajectory. Um, if it's going to re-enter more than one orbit from where it is then, you really can't predict where it'll take place, which is why you don't figure it out to the last minute. Um, and so, yeah, so that that's that difference between the SLS, for example, where you can fly these rockets responsibly, but changing 5B would need to be a redesign because it would either need some sort of upper stage or after spacecraft separation, the core stage needs to do a deorbit maneuver of some kind. Hope that explains the difference and the engineering behind it. Um, all right, so some other questions here. Uh, Paul asked, does China have a plan for deorbiting their space station at end of life? Obviously, this is much further down the road. They're just getting started. But Adrian, any talks on that front? To my knowledge, they have not talked about that yet. But to be fair, the they are just in construction of the, uh, of the space station. So this mm. is the second module. There's at least one this year coming up again. And there, there are more plans to expand the space station. And they are right now even already talk, talking about the next 10 years, potentially 15 years for the space station. So we are a long way down for this. And we always saw this with previous space stations on multiple countries that 15 years initial plan can sometimes mean a way longer time uh, if your space station is still holding up because it's a very expensive project. So if it's still okay to use, you most likely want to use it. Gotcha. Um, and I, I, off the top of my head, I mean, I don't think even NASA... Well, maybe they, there's plans out there, but they just haven't really talked about it a whole lot because it's still pretty far ways off. Like, plans to deorbit the International Space Station are not talked about super frequently either, just because it's not planned to happen anytime soon. Um, but perhaps the plans exist, so. Um, but oh. definitely a worthwhile discussion point. Yeah, the plans to deorbit the ISS, they, they do exist. They've been published before. I think it involved having, like, a progress deorbit 
and then um, progress to a deorbit burn, and then use the station's thrusters on Zezda to continue the deorbit. Basically, like a two-stage deorbit burn because it's so massive. Gotcha. I think we're we're working on Ian's audio. I think he got oh. loud that time. <laughs> uh oh. Trying to fix we'll, that. We'll, we'll get him balanced. Sorry about that chat. Um, and then another question, is there any danger from the debris once it's on the ground? So we talk a lot about, and we'll touch on some other Chinese launches that happened this week because the Chinese space program is very active and the reason we talk about them a lot. Um, but a lot of their older rockets use very, like they use hypergolic propellants, which can be toxic. And if they're flying from those inland launch sites that they're still operating and not moved all of their operations to more responsible launch sites yet either, um, there's been danger about if those stages come down near people, there's like carcinogenic propellants there. Um, the Chengzheng 5B, however, is a step in the right direction on that front because the first stage is hydrolox, liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, right? Yes. But also, it's, it's a kind of in like it, there's almost a comedy in this because we always call uh for for china to use more responsible launch site and right. this actually launches from a way more responsible launch site that is close it to launches the ocean. From a coastal launch site it can launch yeah. safely the propellants aren't toxic and that's they're, the and they're better been... propellants they're actually more efficient like this is a higher performing rocket because of that too by the way but anyway <laughs> yeah basically uh this is kind of they are they're fixing all the other issues and then there's this big major other issue that comes then up and is discussed, which is very understandable and should be discussed. But it's like it's funny how how it it still they still haven't like a uh, launch that is not uh, in, uh, under things that shouldn't happen and that wouldn't right. happen in probably the EU and wouldn't probably happen in the US. Right? It's yeah, they they solved one pro or solved two problems, but kind of created a third one yeah um that hasn't been a problem before and of course this is also a difference between this giant core stage um versus like a small upper stage sometimes it's more common for an a smaller upper stage of a rocket to not necessarily actively deorbit and will passively deorbit over time but those stages are less likely for debris to survive re-entry and make it to the ground it happens sometimes and this ties in with another question that we should talk about the Crew Dragon trunk from a recent SpaceX Crew Dragon mission also re-entered recently. And of course, that's a much smaller piece. It's basically a hollow ring, um, except part of it survived re-entry and landed in Australia. Um, so it's worth mentioning that China is not the only space program that does let debris come to the ground. I think it's worthwhile saying that there's a difference between the responsibility of, oh yeah, we'll let a giant core stage come down versus a small piece of a crew dragon trunk those are very different risk levels but also i mean space the spacex has been asked in the past why don't you do the deorbit burn with the dragon trunk still attached and then jettison the trunk because then the trunk will come down in sort of the same reentry zone and i believe the answer has always been to reserve propellant margins for that deorbit burn so that you don't deorbit while lugging the trunk with you but perhaps that's an evolution that would make that operation also slightly more responsible. So that's worth talking about. Um, I don't know if you had any thoughts on that comparison. Yeah, um, I mean, it's, it, it's an, I don't think it's a fair comparison to make because Dragon's trunk is a lot smaller. Like you said, it's a lot smaller pieces. Um, but at the same time, still, it's something you need to consider because, um, like you said, they don't deal with the trunk. And that goes for both crew and cargo missions. Um, Dragon 2 is considerably heavier than Dragon 1, and that you can actually see that literally because Falcon 9 can't do RTLS landings anymore um, when they launch Dragon missions. Dragon 2 has gotten so much heavier with the life support equipment, right. all the upgrades, the fuel and stuff like that. So they have to leave the trunk in orbit uh, before they do the deorbit burn. So on every Dragon mission, cargo or crew, there's going to be a trunk left in orbit, and that needs to be, I guess, accounted for. Another question here, uh, Tony. Um, so at the new module, well, of course, the purpose of this launch, which we should also talk about, is the Chinese space station launching the second module. It's a science lab. Um, has, I believe, the plan, Adrian, I'll let you dive into this. It docks axially, like the station is just kind of like a long two modules connected to one another um, with the crew vehicle still docked and a, and a cargo vehicle, right? There's two visiting vehicles there right now? Yes, they will dock with the actual port. Mm -hmm. And then the arm will move it to the radial port. That's the, the plan for this module. And that's kind of how they operate a lot with that station. They are 
prefer to dock these with well, actual always and then move to the radial. And yeah, this uh, this module is boosting the capabilities just to give summarize that briefly. It boosts the capabilities for the space station quite a lot. It's a it's a chunky module. It's about twenty two tons, and uh, it's basically the first big science um, expansion for the for the station. And uh, after that, of course, comes Mengtian, comes Mengtian, which will add these same capabilities again. And it uh, is outfitted with all kinds of inside and outside space station uh, equipment that you would expect from a space station. It also has like uh, outside facing ports where you can expose experiments to the vacuum of space. Mm. It is it, it is a very expected science module for a space station. And of course, that's, I think, the good part of this. Like we are not talking, and I, I always like as a person that writes a lot of Chinese launches and covers a lot of Chinese launches, I always like to write about science and mm -hmm. things like like science projects they're doing because that's way more fun to write about than uh, classified military satellite 56th. Right. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so there's, and they, so they dock actually, and this actually ties directly in with how we've done operations on the ISS too. The reason they did that is because, you know, the one axial port is the actual active docking port. So the module can maneuver itself and conduct the docking. But then the radio ports on the side are more like the berthing mechanisms on the ISS, where you kind of need to use the arm and connect it that way. Just similar to how the original Cargo Dragon and the Cygnus vehicle um, don't dock their berth by the arm. And so but designing it that way, they simplify their construction. They can have those berthing modules that are less complicated than the docking port. And you only need one docking port and then you dock and then you use the arm to relocate it. Um, so that's kind of the, um, the, the reasoning behind that. So hope that answers the question. Um, so to clarify, that move hasn't happened yet, right, Agent? We haven't seen them actually move it to the more final location. It has not been confirmed yet. That problem is always we are kind of reliant on them confirming something. It's not like a 24-7 stream of, of the Chinese space station. Um, so we are yeah, kind of waiting on them confirming. There wasn't even the docking wasn't even. It was basically a confirmation tweet where like, hey, we docked. Gotcha, yeah. Um, and then one last question from chat, and then we've also got some super chat questions on the topic. Uh, did any of the rocket actually hit land or just pictures from land? I don't think we've seen any reports of any debris making landfall, right? At least I haven't. I don't so. think so. We've seen it on previous missions. Like we've seen the the the, I guess liquid oxygen or fuel downcomer, um, that's hit land. I don't know about on this recent mission though. Right. So we'll follow those reports. Those could come in later, but uh, I don't think we've seen that yet. Uh, thank you, Todd, for that question. All right, some super chats that have come through here as well. Uh, first of all, Matt Olson for gifting five red team memberships. So Matt, thank you for that support. We really appreciate that. Uh, Musical Wolves has two things. First of all, Long March 5B hard hat fund. Appreciate the support. <laughs> uh, but then also, would China get fined for littering if or something along those lines? We kind of touched on that earlier. We, there's not really a, like a... Maybe well, I'm trying to think what the word is, an uh, outline or an architecture like some sort. Of, there's no template for enforcing any sort of fallout that comes from this kind of event, right? No, I mean I think Australia charged NASA like <laughs> 500 bucks for Skylab deorbiting on Australia. No one ever paid it, so right. I think it's more of just like a just like a symbolic or joking gesture if it ever happens. Mm -hmm. Uh, so thank you for that question. Uh, Ralph just says, happy Sunday, NSF crew. Appreciate that. Uh, and Remy, could we call the SSMEs, the Space Shuttle Main Engines, or the RS-25, same engines on Shuttle and uh, SLS, could we call them sustainer engines? I would say yes. And actually, the Space Shuttle is probably an even better example because the orbiter goes all the way to orbit. Um, of course, the orbiter then also has the orbital maneuvering system, the OMS engines or the AJ-10s that are used for deorbit maneuvers later and obviously steers and lands so it's a more responsible deorbit um question if, if any of the shuttle huggers are watching was the external tank when the external tank separated from the orbiter was it in a stable orbit or was an oms burn required to reach a stable orbit and so they knew where the external tank would re-enter i don't actually remember i think i could beat chris to this it was on suborbital oh he beat me Okay, okay, that we've got confirmed. <laughs> so it was still so warm. So then the OMS, the first OMS burn in a little bit would enter a stable orbit. So again, very similar to the SLS flight profile where you target a Miko 
to the point where the big thing you're worried about rendering will render in a very specific place and time, and you can predict it and protect people from it. Um, so there you go. Uh, all right, I think that wraps up all the questions we had on the topic. Uh, just really quick, uh, Space Nerd with the Super Chat as well. No message, so thank you just for the support there. Um, I think that is our deep dive into the Chinese space program. There was a couple, oh, really quick, there was a couple other uh, launches from China this week. One was a Chengzheng 2D with some Yaogan satellites, um, which is a pretty run-of-the-mill Chinese space launch. Um, they also did debut a, a new rocket, Zonkey 1A. I don't know if I pronounced that right. Uh, Adrian, a quick rundown of the new rocket, if you want. Yeah, just uh, just a quick uh, rundown. It's a fully so solid four-stage vehicle, a small and a small to heavy, uh, small to medium area. Uh, it was a de debut that was kind of rumored for a month or two now. It was kind of always popping up and like. Uh, notices that it might launch soon and was dragged. But yeah, it finally launched. Uh, seems to be like a successful debut from uh, Geoquan. And also that's kind of kicking off the whole uh, situation in Geoquan where a lot of uh, commercial rockets will start there soon. It's uh, becoming a very buzzy area in terms of commercial rockets. And I'm always saying commercial because right. these commercial companies are actually parent companies of the Chinese uh, space agency. So um, yeah, it's uh, it, it, but it's a it's a very interesting area right now that is also uh, tracked with satellites a lot and just interesting to watch. But with also, um, if I if I may set up a segue here with a <laughs> methane based rocket. Oh man! I launch uh, soon there soon there as well. He's a segue master. Yeah, well, let's go ahead and talk about that. So China does have the Zuki two Methalox rocket that's coming at some point in the future. No real details on that front right now but it is in a race with an american rocket and perhaps a couple american rockets depending on how optimistic you are to be the first methalox rocket the first liquid methane and liquid oxygen fueled rocket to make an orbital launch attempt and the front runner on the american side at least in my opinion i'll ask you guys in a second is from relativity space which is a new small site launch company at least initially who's going to launch the terran uh, one rocket uh, it's another small sat launch vehicle designed to operate uh, or launch small payloads to low earth orbit and you can see here uh, this past week they have completed a couple of tests on that first stage which has been sitting out at the pad here at cape canaveral for a little bit while now actually doing their first launch campaign and the testing that goes up to that you can see the nine methalox engines firing in this short clip here um that's a, that's their they called it a hot fire test also known as a static fire test um, and that's a big milestone going into their first launch campaign. Um, that rocket, Terran-1, is preceding the Terran-R rocket, which is a more medium lift and also fully reusable rocket. Um, think of it as a mini starship, if you will, um, but kind of in the more in the Falcon 9 class of mass to orbit. Um, but so Relativity's longer term plans include that. And they also recently talked about a Mars mission where they were going to launch a Mars lander uh, made by a company called Impulse Space, which was founded by Tom Muller of SpaceX rocket development fame um, is, as soon as 2024, which is also the year that Terran R is supposed to debut. I think that's just the beginning of the when they're hoping to have Terran R um, operational. But you can see some rendering of the new rocket later down the line there. But first things first is Terran 1, which could become the first Methalux rocket to attempt to reach orbit. Um, so Adrian, let's go with you. What are the odds of Terran 1 versus the Z Chinese Zuki 2 versus some of the bigger other Methalux rockets that are here in the States? I feel like uh, it's a, it's an interesting race right now. I, I think there's like three contenders that are really high in the race. Which are SpaceX Starship, it's uh, it's uh, Zuki two, and it's uh, Terran one. I think that that's I we all three kind of agree that these three are the like the the probably one of them will take the title. Um, mm -hmm. I think. So, I if you asked me one or two months ago, I would have said Zuki two. At this point, um, the the rumor that is flying around is that they are having some sort of issues and they are needing some more time to. Um, getting the rocket ready. So at this point, it looks to me like Terran One might just pass them on the left lane, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, it might be Terran One that will win the Methalox race to orbit. But that's just my—it's a very guesswork feeling. But that's like my feeling, right? Ian, what are your thoughts? Who's your favorite for the Methalox race to orbit? Yeah, I'll be honest. I don't know too much about ZooQ. Um... I think Adrian. I, I would I would agree with or uh, I would trust Adrian more with that because he's a China uh, rocket expert here. Um, 
But yeah, I think uh, Terran 1 has a very good shot at it. They've completed the spin start test. They've completed a static fire test on the first stage. Again, that was just with the first stage. It's not like the whole vehicle is integrated on the pad. So they'll need to bring it back to the hangar, do some final integration. But in terms of testing, it seems like they're getting pretty close to being launch ready. Um, now being launch ready and being launching are two different things. They could have several delays. Right. They could find issues along the way. But I, I think Terran, Terran 1 could have it. If they if they stick to schedule, yeah, I think those two are definitely the front runners. And of course, the other options that we'd be looking at are Starship. So SpaceX Starship is obviously methylox fueled on both stages, and I think the error bars on the predicted launch date for Starship are wider than any of the other rockets we'd be talking about, right? So sure, it could launch next month. It could also launch like next year. So you know, it, I think there's a lot of um, error bars there. Um, the other rocket that I think would be in the running is United Launch Alliance's Vulcan rocket, which is not Methalox on both stages. The second stage is a Centaur stage, hydrogen. Um, but the first stage is Methalox fueled, of course, powered by the Blue Origin BE-4 engine. And you know what? I just realized, I think there's a, an asset that might be worth showing ah, on this yep. screen that I just realized I totally didn't get. Hold on, chat. I know the picture you all want to see. I'm looking at them. <laughs> Where let's are my engines, Mike, chef? Let's, let's see if Michael can Google it faster than me, though. <laughs> um, let's see. I got those copy here. I'm putting it here. Oh, well, that's not how you paste that, Thomas. Here, Michael, that link. <laughs> so we should, while we're talking about this, we should talk about the other milestone in the Methalox race to orbit. So Tori Bruno is sharing some images of the first flight BE-4 engines. Um, the first one has actually been shipped off to the Blue Origin test site in West Texas. And um, that that shipment is for them to go do its uh, like acceptance testing uh, before it gets shipped to ULA. Um, and they'll assemble that in Decatur, Alabama with the Vulcan core stage and then ship that all out to the launch site. Um, this is just the first flight engine. Obviously, the core stage is powered by two. And they, he shared a different image at some point on his Twitter um, of the second engine, which is almost complete. So they finished the first one, they've shipped that out, and the second one is going to be shortly behind it. Um, and I think that is one of the items that will give us an idea as to when Vulcan's first flight could occur. Um, now, here's another question in this conversation about the Methalox race to orbit. And I'll ask you guys' opinion here. There's a difference between the first rocket to make an attempt to reach orbit, and there's a different question as to which one will successfully reach orbit first. So, of the rockets that are powered, at least in part, by Methalox, so we'll count Vulcan, even though the Hydrolox upper stage, um, which do you think is the first one to successfully reach orbit? You have Suki-2, which is a Chinese rocket, and... I don't know, Adrian, you can offer your insight here, but I there's been some Chinese rockets that have made successful first flights and some that haven't. You have Terran 1, which again, even in the U.S. is small. In fact, I can't think of a small sat launch vehicle here in the U.S. that was successful on the first attempt. Launcher 1 didn't. Astra's rocket didn't. Rocket Lab didn't. Firefly didn't. So yeah, Falcon I don't... So actually, which one? Falcon 1 didn't either. Falcon 1 didn't. Yeah, if you count Falcon 1. So... All right, so maybe the odds are not in Tehran's failure uh, favor. Failure. Um, <laughs> the Freudian slip there, um, <laughs> but of course that's too expected with a first flight. That's in the accepted range of you know what might be acceptable. It's, the big thing is to get a lot of data so you can build on it and have a better chance of success on flight two. Um, so for those two rockets, I think that's definitely in the mix. Starship is maybe a bit of a wild card. Would like your thoughts on that. And then Vulcan, I think Vulcan, would I would I be wrong to say Vulcan is the one that we could be most confident in based on just how ULA structures their like pre-flight testing regime and how they try to more exhaustively test things before a first flight rather than the like break in and refly fast kind of mentality that SpaceX has. Uh, Adrian, why don't you go first? What are your thoughts on that discussion? I will just start with Zucre 2 because I think that helps to provide some... Uh context there um it's a quite conservative design with uh, them using rocket parts from other chinese rockets basically the 3.35 okay. diameter so they're using tank structures they're using just an open cycle engine so they're they are kind of in the very um yeah in the, in the conservative part of what they are trying here and also they are aiming for a very high cadence to get these rockets to launch so the, the initial plan that the uh, CEO outlined at the beginning is was to build 15 rockets this year. This might not be on track 
completely, mm -hmm. but we saw hardware of like two, uh, like another stage, uh, like an, we saw, shout outs to Harry Stranger here. Um, <laughs> there we saw hardware laying around that was most likely part of a second rocket. So they are, they, if they're failing, they might be very fast to recover from that. Sure. That's my expectation. I think they might be in the same ballpark though as Terran One, as in I think it's without without like say, saying that is unexpected. I think that the odds that the first flight might fail for these two is maybe a bit higher than a success. I wouldn't say that, for example, for Vulcan. I think Vulcan is. Vulcan would be kind of bad if, if it fails on the first flight. I feel like how they are structuring this and how ULA operates as a company, I feel like they are they are gearing up for having this a success from the start. And also, they are probably way deeper into testing every single bit before launch than every other company. So, yeah. yeah. I feel like that will be a success on the first flight. With Starship... <laughs> oh, boy. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, that's a great summary. Thank you, Adrian. That'll be your answer on Starship. Uh, yeah, uh, Ian, yeah. Ian, Ian, want to summarize Starship for us? Uh, oh boy, yeah. <laughs> I, I would not bet on it in either direction. Um, right. Because, yeah, like, like Thomas even said, SpaceX has a different approach to flight testing than ULA or most other companies, honestly. For SpaceX, I mean, as we saw with, like, the first, what was it, one, two, three, four Starship flights, SN8 through 11, it doesn't matter if they fail that much as long as you can get some data from it get yourself a little further in your test campaign get a little closer to solving that problem and then have something like sn15 where it lands very well um the orbital flight could be something along those lines it could be you know a failure of stage separation that they fix on the next flight or a failure of raptor ignition or something mm -hmm. but with spacex i would give them a higher odds of failure than others but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, because again, like we said, like Starship is a rapid iteration, rapid fail, rapid fix, fly again. I mean, this configuration of test equipment, Booster 7 and Ship 24, we don't even know if Booster 7 is flying anymore, but that's the second set of um, orbital test hardware that they've built. So they've already made improvements over the first set. It's already rapid prototyping that they've scrapped their first set of orbit-ready vehicles. So mm -hmm. I, I think... It doesn't matter if SpaceX fails, really. They, they could, it could be like a year before they reach orbit, you know? Sure. I feel like, just to, to add to that, I feel like Starship also is, if you compare these four, it's by far the most ambitious uh, and like most groundbreaking of the four. Yeah. It is, uh, it uses a, a, a new engine type with the full flow stage combustion. It uh, uses, it's by far the biggest rocket, not even like by far. And it's also f the first fully reusable um, of that kind. So it's kind of, it, it checks the most marks of the things that could fail because they right, are new. Sure. So, yeah, sure. Yeah. I yeah, think that definitely, just ties uh, in there. Yeah, de definitely a really good discussion there. Um, also, Jeb does point out in chat that he knows one American small site launcher that worked on the first flight, Pegasus. If you go back to the original small sat launch vehicle, uh, Pegasus did work on the first attempt. So thank you, Jeb, uh, for pointing that out. Um, but yeah, and I, I mean, of course, would love to see Terran 1 succeed on the first attempt, um, but it would be understandable if it took an extra try or so. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's something we're all obviously going to be keeping a very close eye on. Terran 1, definitely an exciting flight here from Florida. Um, looking forward to that flight and keeping an eye on the other Methalox rockets that are in the race. But let's go ahead and move on to some There's more one news. one more thing. Oh, go ahead, Adrian. Never mind. I'm just looking at a poll that was started by NASA Spaceflight Actual. Oh, Christopher no. <laughs> um, that is about asking about the best-looking engine. And he uh, proposed the F1, the SSME, so ours 25, B4 or Raptor V2. So uh, I feel I like there's an, there's an answer that he wants us all to click. <laughs> yeah, I feel like there's... And that answer is right now not winning. So uh, what's, gonna... <laughs> what's, what's your take? I'm going to play suck up and say, uh, hey, boss, I voted for RS-25. <laughs> Best looking. The RS-25 is a pretty cool looking engine. Um, yeah, actually, I'm going to vote RS-25. I'm not I'm even going... sucking up. That's just my legitimate answer. No, yeah, I, I like it. it. It looks sleek, but also extremely complicated. 
And like oh, the fact my... that they made it in the time, it was just unbelievable. I am very much not surprised at the answer that is winning. However, I did yeah. a I did a poll on Twitter about who what who would win the best logs race to orbit. And I said before the poll even started, like Starship is going to win the poll, no matter what people, whatever the realistic answer is, Starship will win the poll. And I was right. So, <laughs> uh, the internet is, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, but B4 anyway. for me, by the way. Just B4? B4 yes, is not a bad looking engine. It looks yeah, cool. It's, it looks cool. Um, it will I, look uh, even better when it's on the Vulcan rocket, is my answer. <laughs> or on I, the base uh, of the new Glenn. Or I'm totally a member of the uh, I, like, I Like New Glenn club, fan club. So um, <laughs> yes, I, uh, I I think the B4 just looks fantastic. I I know there was this Christmas tree joke because of all the cables, but I feel like it looks classic and but also <laughs> kind of cool and modern. So I'm 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 B4 here. I mean, also the first iteration of BE4 too. Like, remember how bad, right, sure. complicated Raptor One looked. Right now they're on BE4 One, if you will. Yeah. So. If you don't, I mean, obviously there were test engines and stuff. So like, depending on where you start the numbering, but yeah, yeah. I, I, we see your point for sure. Um, all right, we're halfway through the show, and we got more to talk about, so let's get on to the next topic. And Ian, I mentioned that we were going to talk about this, and your eyes lit up, so I'm going to let Ian do the deep dive into this. So we've got some updated news on NASA's plans for Mars sample return, returning samples that have been collected from Mars back to Earth so that we're not limited by studying them on the, rover, on the stuff we have on our rovers. We can bring them back and use our full laboratories to study rocks from the Martian surface. Super, super exciting. And there's been some updated plans as to how NASA is going to accomplish this. Ian, take it away. What is the latest? Yeah, so first off, I want to kind of address what Mars sample return is. And if you look at the picture uh, over here, you could already tell it is not a simple mission. It is immensely complex. So first off... At uh, high risk? First... <laughs> I'm just going to pretend that didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> Good meme, though. But yeah, so starting off, they already have the first part of Mars sample return on Mars right now, and that is Perseverance. So Perseverance, um, over the past few months, it's been collecting samples. Um, so whereas Curiosity, Perseverance's predecessor, that had a sort of onboard science lab, that has been replaced on Perseverance with a sample caching system. So they have, I think around like 30 little tubes, about the size of like your pinky finger, actually. Um, and they'll get like, they'll drill, get a little sample about the size of your pinky finger, seal it up in the tube, and then put it into the sample cache. Um, and then eventually, once that's all filled up over the next few years or whatever happens, Perseverance will um, keep those samples on board. Um, now, what will happen after that is the Earth return orbiter from the European Space Agency will launch to Mars that will get into orbit. Um, and then the, uh, the, I guess, the sample fetching lander is going to land. Um, that will land nearby Perseverance. And then what will happen is Perseverance is expected to drive up to near the lander deposit all its samples in like one big pile um, and then the uh, the lander will have a robotic arm to grab each sample load it on board <laughs> and then what they're going to do is they have a rocket on board they're not going to launch the rocket from the lander they're going to fling the rocket into the air <laughs> ignite the first stage of the rocket in mid-air about a few meters off the ground and then from there they're going to ascend to orbit this is a two-stage rocket lifting off from mars um, and that rocket will have the samples on board. They'll transfer to the Earth return orbiter once in orbit, and that'll take them back to Earth. Um, but what has really changed in this uh, profile over the past week, um, they have announced, if you look on the far left of that image, they are including two helicopters on this mission. And not just two helicopters, two helicopters derived from Ingenuity. Um, now, these helicopters are going to be the backups. So if Perseverance can't drive over to the lander or if there's some issue in transferring the samples to the lander, they're going to use these helicopters to grab the samples and return them to the lander, um, which I think is just a tremendous use of the technology because, as remember, Ingenuity was supposed to fly three to five times and then just be shut down. They did not expect it to last longer. It has completed over 25 flights, I believe, and it is still going strong. Um, so I, I think that's a great use of the technology. It's so cool to see this development continuing. Um, they are currently in their, uh, their mission concept phase. So basically where they're just looking over every detail. Can something go wrong here? Can something be improved here? Um, and that's going to be continuing over the next few months. Um, this sample return mission is not expected to really kick into gear until about 2027. That is when the first element, which I believe is the Earth return orbiter, 
orbiter, the Earth return orbiter is going to launch to Mars. Um, and then in 2028, that'll be followed by the lander. Uh, so we're still a little while away from it happening, and samples won't be returned to Earth until 2033. Uh, but still, this looks to be a very exciting mission, and it's at least very exciting to me to see it actually being developed and not just stuck on paper. Because as of like a few years ago, NASA had no other plans to send Mars mm -hmm. to mission to Mars. Perseverance was pretty much the end of NASA's Mars ambitions until the Mars sample return came along. So very ambitious mission, a lot of ways it can go wrong, but also it's using a lot of well understood technology um the ingenuity helicopter uh has proven to be very useful they're including two of those on board uh the solid rocket motors the star motors which are on the uh the ascent vehicle those have been used for decades those are extremely reliable motors they are already undergoing immense testing at the jet propulsion laboratory so everything on this mission is going to be very well understood and i think they have very good odds of success for a mission this ambitious. I'm very excited to see what happens here and to see how it continues to evolve over the next few years. Yeah, um, I think my the biggest, obviously the big change being from the extra rover that goes out and retrieve it and the help, they did, getting rid of that and adding the addition of the helicopters. Um, first of all, I think this ties in, you mentioned how Mar there wasn't a lot of talk of what NASA was going to do on Mars um, after Mars 2020. Obviously, Mars Sample Return has been in development for a while, and they just weren't really talking about it as much. Now they're more into the able to share more of the details because they're starting to actively contract out the actual construction of these other vehicles. The helicopters is a direct result of ingenuity. The ingenuity was a tech demonstrator. It was to prove that you could fly on Mars. You don't just fly on Mars, though, for the heck of it and just go, all right, we've done it, checkbox, we'll never do that again. The whole purpose of that is to prove that you can then send different ones that are actually have missions. And so um, it's definitely cool to see that those lessons learned already being applied onto a direct mission. Um, it does also, it is also going to help um, with the mission to Titan, uh, Dragonfly. I was forgetting the name of it for a second. Um, Dragonfly, so that is worth mentioning as well. But yeah, I mean, the idea of <laughs> flinging a rocket from a lander so that you can get it off the ground and then lighting two solid stages into orbit and then that rendezvousing with the orbiter from the European Space Agency that can bring the samples back. I mean, that's it's a pretty complicated infrastructure. Um, we do have a question here. Why is... The recent change, I mean, this is already such a complex architecture, is really adding these two backup helicopters less risky than the fetch rover that was originally planned? Like, is this really a risk reduction? Yeah, uh, I actually forgot to mention that. Yeah, so the the uh, the uh, the profile for this mission has evolved. They first uh, planned to land a second rover, the sample fetch rover, um, and that would have basically drove around grabbing all the samples, perseverance drops off. Um, but now Perseverance is kind of taking on that role. Um, so yeah, two helicopters, I, I think it mostly goes down to um, having, I guess, minimal risk. Um, so you have two helicopters, and those are backups. So Perseverance right. is the primary with a backup and a backup for that backup. Mm -hmm. So now you have several kind of stages of redundancy, whereas the sample return rover was just a single thing if the rover did not land correctly, if, say, one of the motors wasn't working, if it was dead on arrival, you would have a big problem. Um, and then that kind of goes into a, another question that I saw Tony here in chat asking is, how do they even know that Perseverance is going to last that long? And that really goes off kind of what JPL has been doing with uh, Curiosity, Opportunity, Spirit. They have said, okay, this rover is going to last for two years. That was Curiosity. Curiosity landed <laughs> in 2013. And it's still it's going, by the way. <laughs> yeah. And Opportunity landed in, what was it, like 2006, I think? Opportunity died in 2018, which and, is but, like... And the big difference there, though, Opportunity and just like Spirit are solar-powered. And, I mean, the biggest theory of why Opportunity did eventually die was because it was not generating enough power. Yeah. Curiosity is nuclear-powered, just like Perseverance. Mm -hmm. And really no signs of stopping, right? Yeah. Yeah, Curiosity can be last probably easily into the late 2020s, maybe even the early 2030s. At that point, they're probably going to have to do some uh, power saving where they shut off certain instruments just to save a little bit of power. Um, Perseverance is even newer, so it has newer plutonium on board. Mm -hmm. And with Curiosity, I think the main thing right now that's the concern for it continuing to 
youth continuous mission is its wheels. So Curiosity's wheels are slowly eroding away. It's still perfectly drivable, but its wheels are kind of the limiting factor. They've noticed that, and with Perseverance, it has a brand new wheel design that are better engineered to survive uh, Mars's ground and will uh, erode a lot slower. So if wheels are the only problem with Curiosity, Perseverance should be going for a long time. And to tie back into this, Neil also asked, um, "Will Percy's rover get uh, the per will Percy's range get lower as it collects more samples due to it becoming heavier?" Does that tie into the conversation about perseverance lasting long enough to uh, act as the sample retrieval rover? Yeah, I mean, collecting samples again, like the samples are about the size of your pinky finger, so maybe about like the weight of a normal sized piece of gravel. It's more or less negligible maybe it'll have maybe it can't go like as like maybe like a few inches shorter than it could before but at the end of the day it's really not going to do that much and with perseverance they drive it really slowly and for short periods of time it's not like it's driving for two days straight they have to stop it check around with the cameras make sure everything's okay recharge the batteries a little bit so excuse me they're it's not really much of a detriment to its range or its capabilities having the samples gotcha um, there's definitely some questions about um, some firsts that are going to happen from this mission. Now, obviously, the big one, launching a rocket from Mars, with that that period has never happened. We've never nothing has ever lifted off from the surface of Mars. Well, all right, I guess ingenuity technically, but and then <laughs> landed. I meant a rocket yeah. going to space has never <laughs> lifted off from Mars. Um, would this be the first two-stage launch from any other world? Because the lunar module was a single stage to orbit. I'm trying to think. Where's the? I mean, that's yeah. kind. Of, that's kind well, of it, right? This is the first ever staging that's happening off of Earth, which is just mind-boggling to think of. Like we're going to be staging a rocket inside Mars's atmosphere, um, and yeah, besides the lunar modules on the Moon, this is the first ever lifting off of another planet. Mm -hmm. um, which again, there's a lot at risk there, and I've actually I've read through some of the reports JPL has put out. One of their main concerns is the temperature of the solid fuel. And hmm. we know SRBs have temperature issues because of Challenger. This, this isn't really in the same vein as that, but SRBs can kind of get a little uh, feisty when, they have, when they're at the wrong temperature. And Mars is very cold. It has temperature swings pretty high during the day, pretty low at night. Um, so that's one of their main concerns. And they're going to be incorporating heaters into these motors to keep them at a stable temperature throughout the mission. Um, and again, that has to work or else there may be issues on ascent. They may not ignite things like that. So, and that is why GPL is doing extensive testing right now with Northrop Grumman to make sure that these motors work at the temperatures, at the pressures, uh, with the heaters active, things like that. Um, so there's a lot at play here, but they're doing extensive testing. And I think that's really the key to this being a success. Gotcha. Um, also, just Michael pointing out in our back channel also that China China does their lunar sample return, which was, again, another single state, so another example of lifting off from a different celestial body, but, for again, first staging event on Mars, so that'll be pretty cool. I, I, I don't know, can we say it's three stages because you got to throw the rocket in the air? Like, does that count? <laughs> is throwing a rocket a stage? It's a little booster. Or is that just it's stage zero? Point. We're going with a stage zero nomenclature? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I feel like, I feel like, that's, like that is stage zero, right? Because the main... Thing that does the lifting is not leaving like not like i don't know ksb tells me stage zero is actually the last stage so i don't know what's going on oh. uh, <laughs> it's true um really quick i just thought this message was funny uh dolphin productions nasa has flown ingenuity on another planet without crashing more than i have flying my drone on earth <laughs> <laughs> Same. appreciate the message there i mean ingenuity also there's no trees on mars for it to get yeah out. there's a lot less to hit on mars yeah, that's, that's a good point <laughs> i've got my drone stuck in trees. a tree before <laughs> Always it's, the trees. I've got <laughs> 30 foot up in a tree before and my heart just sank. <laughs> we, ha we have like a huge uh, area where I can fly my drone. There's one tree in the middle. I managed to hit that one. <laughs> um, and so another question here. Steve is asking, how many samples are they aiming to return, Ian? Uh, yeah, so I'm looking that up. I can't find a, a specific number. I feel like I've read it around 30 to 40 samples. Um, and actually, I've recently found out that it's not just rock samples. They have gotten, they, I think they currently have nine rock samples from like very interesting looking rocks or areas, but they also have one atmospheric sample. Um, and I would hmm. assume for that, what they do, they basically just open the cap up and then close the cap. So you have like an idea of the gases in Mars atmosphere. And while we do have like an indication of like what gases there are, having a, a specific sample to analyze of actual Martian air 
could be extremely helpful to understand more about the planet. So they're not just having rock samples, which is pretty cool. That's interesting. I didn't even think about that. Although, also, I mean, I'm assuming the tubes that have the rock samples also have some Martian atmosphere in them. Like, I'm sure they're not filled to the brim with only rock, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and what the atmospheric sample actually is, is kind of like a, uh, what's it called? Um, a test, I think. Uh, so basically, they're going to be used that to figure out what gases are in Mars's atmosphere. Oh, and when they analyze okay. the rocks, they'll say, okay, we found carbon dioxide and these other gases. That's also in the atmosphere, so kind of cancel those out. Gotcha. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. That's yep. very interesting. Um, all right, so other questions I definitely want to touch on on this topic here. First of all, Micah with the Red Team membership. So thank you for the membership support there. We greatly appreciate that. Um, here is a question, and I'm going to read it as is. It's a little it's a little spicy, but it's an interesting topic point, so I'm going to ask it. Um, Jesse Bear says, why are we planning missions for 2026 that will use absurdly obsolete technology to think that Starship and New Glenn won't have done orbital missions in 2026 is laughable? So let's take this piece by piece. The spirit of the question, of course, why this, this is a little bit down the line. Is, is 2026 the right date for what, what's the timeline on this? Yeah, so the first parts of the mission are going to be launching in 2027, 2028, and then throughout the next few years, they'll be underdoing, they'll be going the process of getting the samples, launching the rocket, and then returning to Earth for 2033. Um, yeah, I don't know if obsolete technology is the right term, more like established technology, um, because there's really nothing on here that's just like, why are they using it? They have a helicopter. They are launching a rocket off of Mars. They are returning samples back to Earth, which have only been done a few times. Um, so there, there's a lot of new technology. There's a lot of risk here. It's not like they're just launching, say, like an Apollo lunar lander, which is obsolete technology. Um, this is a lot of technology. I think this is kind of a safe way to play it in case Starship doesn't work out or gets significantly delayed. Again, we've heard... Starship landing crew on Mars in 2024 is not. <laughs> Will it even happen this decade? Is the kind of the big question right now. So this is kind of like a concrete kind of foundation that is like, okay, even if Starship, say if the program is a complete failure, we'll still have this to fall back on, kind of. And this will bring. And also the thing is, with Perseverance, they are targeting specifically ge geologically interesting targets. If mm. they see a rock that says that doesn't look Martian, that looks like a meteorite, or that has very interesting signatures, could that be life? They will sample that. It's not like they're just grabbing a scoop of dirt saying, that's Mars, and flinging it back, <laughs> you know? And Perseverance will be doing these samples across the next several years. So they're going to get a wide variety of just materials available to sample. So I don't think it's really good to call this kind of useless or obsolete when what is the second best option right now? When is that going to launch? You know? <laughs> uh, sorry. I have something I want to add to this conversation, but our good friend, Adrian, oh, listen, no. Adrian, we have given you like multiple weeks now to avoid this poll. And what your reaction tells me what the answer of this <laughs> poll is. And it's really a problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. About this question. Um, I think uh, I I really think uh, that the uh, should we do a live stream of Adrian watching this movie? Actually, that might be planned on the member Discord. <laughs> There's already the I already got some like plugins sent to me that can be used to like uh, so we can watch on the Discord. So there's stay stuff going on there. Um, so make sure you're joining Capcom and above if you want to join that. Um, <laughs> Adrian using this for a membership plug. That is the greatest thing. Um. But yeah, I oh uh, I mean, let's NASA needs to like plan at some point how they want to use this. And waiting for Starship or New Glenn to become operational before they really can plan a mission, yeah, I mean, they, they, at some point they need to commit to a mission. They need to commit on mm -hmm. on this doing this thing. And yes, it would be great if Starship can just fly in 2026 to to Mars and like, I don't know, bring back 10 tons of rocks. Yeah. Yes would be cool. But do we only want to bet on that one card to get that? Or do we, I mean, let's be real. The, the worst option here is, yeah, yeah, it works. And they get, more, they, they get something. If they, and if Starship gets there earlier, cool. Then we have more rocks. I like more rocks. 
and um, it's more science, more science, more better. And yeah. uh, so, so I, I don't think it's a, it's an either or thing, or more, and more like an and thing. And uh, I really like that, and I think it's a, a good way and resources. Yeah, for sure. First of all, nice deflection, Adrian. Well handled. Uh, second of all, to wrap off our actual discussion, um, yeah, I think it's worth mentioning, like NASA can't go to SpaceX right now and say, we would like to contract with you to return samples of Mars to Earth. Because Starship hasn't reached orbit yet. <laughs> Starship has not gone above 12 kilometers yet. Yeah, it is very unclear when Starship will be ready to make a first Mars attempt. I think it would not be unreasonable to predict that Starship will make an uncrewed Mars landing attempt this decade. I think that's actually a pretty strong guess. Whether that's successful is a different conversation. And then a crewed Mars landing is definitely next decade at the minimum, um, mm -hmm. I think would be my, um, my, my prediction. Um, but even that the first Mars landing, the goal isn't going to be like, our first Mars landing goal is to collect samples from Mars and return on Earth. No, the goal of the first Mars landing will be to land and not explode. <laughs> like, you have to set the standards there, right? Yep. Um, and so it's not even fair to count on that first Mars landing as a method of Mars sample return. So maybe if that's somehow a stretch goal, sure. Um, but I think it makes a lot of sense for NASA to be developing these technologies that are based on landers that have already worked very well understood solid rocket motors the ingenuity helicopter that is very well understood those systems that we know are very reliable designing a mars sample return with that architecture even on the time frame of late 2020s um to early 2030s is i think makes a lot of sense now and then they can um what's the word i'm looking for add on mm -hmm. a starship starship architecture returns down the road Yep. Um, when that capability comes online. And I think NASA would be very interested in doing that. They're just not in the position to do that right now. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I actually, oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, 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 Ian, go. I was going to say, I actually looked it up while you were discussing, and Perseverance has 43 sample tubes. Um, 38 mm. of those are going to be used for either solid or uh, air um, samples. Um, the other five are witness tubes, basically just like empty tubes that are basically to have as a... Um, basically a way to say what was in these tubes before it launched so like the earth um, atmosphere um, any other materials from earth so basically can say oh we found bacteria in this tube oh but the same bacteria is in the witness tube so it kind of cancels mm -hmm. out okay so there's a lot of method it's a very in-depth here about like what they've do done to ensure that what they analyze is only mars and they could cancel out anything that is not mars related all right, and I want to cap off our discussion of Mars sample returns so we can move on. Uh, Jesse Bear, I had another message that says that I meant that NASA seems very adverse to new technology. Most of the stuff we use was invented in 1960. I think that is changing, and I think that stuff that's flying these days, including their involvement with SpaceX and some of the Artemis stuff, um, and combined with some of the near-future Mars missions, will change that. But I understand I, I, we understood the point of the question, and we did want to talk about that, so thank you. Um, and then some other messages that have come through here. Let's see. Uh, Keith asking, is the Earth return transfer window the same as the Mars transfer window? Not really. Basically, so to launch from Mars to Earth, you want to launch when Earth is... Or, sorry, I said that backwards. To launch from Earth to Mars, you want to launch when Earth is catching up to Mars when with respect to their orbits. And then to return from Mars to Earth, you want to launch when mars is ahead of earth because if you are in a higher orbit relative to the sun in this case you're traveling more slowly so if you're going from mars to earth mars needs to be ahead of earth in its orbit so that the rock so that whatever you're launching can basically slowly have earth catch up to it if that makes sense um so the windows are different and there's like a minimum wait period between when something lands on mars and when it will be able to efficiently return to Earth. Um, and you could do the math behind that. Um, Cosmic Train Schedule is a great resource for calculating the transfer windows between different things. Uh, but thank you for your question there. Um, let's see, okay, so then um, to wrap up these couple of super tests that have come through here before we move on here, uh, Ethel, I believe is how I'm pronouncing this. I hope I got that right. It says, after some travel and personal commitments earlier this year, I finally got to catch up with all the amazing content that you guys produce. So thank you for always being professional, knowledgeable, and fun. I'm not sure we're always professional. Profes professional? That's not a word. <laughs> professional. 
But, Ethel, thank you so much for the kind words and for the support there. We're glad that you are enjoying the coverage, and we hope you keep tuning in. Um, and then, Moldy Space Industries, there's a name we know. Thank you for gifting five Red Team memberships, Moldy Space. We appreciate that so much. Um, all right, again, that is Mars Sample Return. we got two more topics I want to get through here. Of course, we're going to get to Starship in a second, but really quick, I want to run through the latest International Space Station news as well. Um, so this all started with, first of all, and then we, are, we talked about this, two shows ago, I think, um, that there's a new chief of Roscosmos. Uh, this man, Vladimir... Oh, nope, just kidding. That is a... That's not the director. I got the name wrong. Um, Yuri Borisov is the new director um, of Roscosmos, taking uh, Rogozin's job. And uh, he, in a talk with Vladimir Putin, president of Russia, um, said that the, quote, the decision to leave the station after 2024 has been made. Now, the important part of that... Um, sentence is the after in front of 2024 and the original reports didn't really stress this the correct way i don't think a lot of people said oh russia is really planning on leaving the station soon the reason they say after 2024 is because they are committed to certain partnerships involved with the iss program through like at least 2024 um and then the basically this thread that we're showing here there's a great thread by katya that you should definitely read into but the, one of the designers at RSC Energia, one of the state-owned corporations in Russia that produce space hardware, um, basically goes into detail and said, look, we are committed to fulfilling our obligations to the International Space Station program, and we are not going to leave the ISS until they have their own new space station, the Russian Orbital Space Segment or something, it, ROS is the acronym, um, is operational and crewed. They want to have a continuous presence of Russian cosmonauts in space. And so they're not leaving the ISS until the new station is ready. That is very different from saying they're going to leave the ISS like in 2024. And the important part is like it will be at least 2024, probably even later, before Russia is ready to leave the International Space Station program. Um, so that was an important uh, clarification to come from this change of leadership at Roscosmos. Obviously, there's a lot of current events going on, including a war in Ukraine that... Um, I have some effects on international partnerships, especially with Russia. Um, but it does seem that they are still committed to fulfilling their ISS obligations. And it does sound like all of the involved, all of the agencies involved with this partnership are hoping to maintain those international partnerships despite current events here on Earth. Um, Adrian, I'll start with you. Any thoughts you want to add to this discussion about Russia's um, updated plans for their ISS involvement? Yeah, I mean, it always... I mean, the rumors that the Russians will leave the ISS are basically om you know, omnipresent all the time. They always came up. This is more, this is a bit more yeah, meat to the bone compared to previous times. They kind of hinted it. But on the other hand, I feel like this also, of course, there's huge political motivation in this as well. There's, they, with the geopolitical situation, this is also motivated by this in some way or form. And yeah, I mean, at some even even the US is talking about phasing out the ISS at some point. Right. And but just like Russia, we have our plans for. There's some commercial companies yeah. developing their own modules. Axiom Space is like the front runner. And I, yeah. while I don't know if I've seen this said explicitly, I think the understanding is that NASA is planning to move low Earth orbit research to new space stations before leaving the ISS, so there isn't a gap there. Just like Russia said. Yeah, it's uh. I feel like it's. I will wait how this plays out because, mm -hmm. as you said, twenty twenty four or later can be a lot of. There's a lot of years after twenty twenty four. Infinite, so, technically, yeah. <laughs> yeah, technically, uh, technically infinite amount of years. Yeah, not so, wrong. So uh, I will wait how this really plays out. How fast they get their modules launched, and that, that's always the part of this, right? Because they are not in a situation right now where they can basically fully focus on building a space station. They have. They have, they are in a war, so they are based, they are attacking another country. So it's a, uh, it's not really that I see them focusing on a big space program right now. So we will sure. see how, how they are really progressing in this timeline, and I, how this changed and how what administrator it will be or whatever. Like I, I feel like there's a lot of things that will change down the road here. Sure, Ian. Yeah, I, I would agree. Like, I, like Adrian said, this is a new 
Yuri Borisov is a new leader of Roscosmos. He's only been here for a few weeks now. We don't know what his administration technique is going to be like. Could he secure Roscosmos more funding? Could he restructure to make the odds of the Ross station happening more likely? Because as of right now, the Ross station is just a module that is just kind of basically just like a big hunk of aluminum that they're currently sanding down. Um, they are not flight ready with their Ross station. Um, I think if they chose right at 2024 to cut off and transition to Ross, they will be minimum several years without any sort of space presence. Because without a space station to go to, what is Russia going to do in low Earth orbit? Um, Soyuz can only be up there for so long. And so I think that they should be careful about this. Either ensure that Ross is in orbit and capable of crew stays before 2024, or stay with the space station as long as you can until Ross is launched. And um, I was also reading through a few days ago um, statements by Yuri Borisov. He said that engineers are currently concerned about the idea of a sort of chain reaction or domino effect of technical failures happening on the Russian segment. Mm. These modules are two decades old. They were supposed to fly on a successor to the Mir space station. These are old modules, old designs. There's nothing inherently wrong about that. They're just coming up on the end of their life. And eventually there's going to come a tipping point where the 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 use case you're getting out of them and the cost of maintaining them are going to kind of overlap. And then you're going to have mm -hmm. to pay more and more and more to maintain them, to fix the issues. I mean, we've already seen several leaks on these segments, on, the, on these modules. Right. It's getting old. And eventually there's going to be a point where there's not going to be enough use case to keep them active when that point is i don't know but there's a lot of factors at play here and i think we're going to have to watch over the next few years to see how it develops and what happens all right um i think that wraps up our our russian updates there and i want to talk a little bit about this other space program that some people care about i guess sometimes uh that shiny rocket down at the uh, southern tip of texas there um so yes this is definitely where we want to wrap up our show here because we're into the business end of starship testing once again we are expecting static fire testing hopefully very very soon um i think we said that last time we talked about this on this show but we're we are actually very close to starship testing we hope um there has been um we saw flap testing this week so we do they're getting to some other milestones on starship but uh, Adrian, want to just give us a quick rundown of the latest of Starbase and what you're looking forward to this next week and what spreadsheets you'll be looking to work with? Yeah, it's uh, we are getting into the, the very interesting part. It's always, always interesting, but this is really, really interesting because we are, it feels like very close to Ship 24 firing up. It, uh, it really feels like they I mean, I just missed out last week and, and getting to a past these spin prime tests they performed now. I think it's five spin prime tests now performed on uh, ship 24. So yeah, next up we expect them to get into like pre-burner static fire testing. Really the the the, the stuff we love that produces <laughs> thrust, that produces fire. And yeah, yeah, that's the I would say, at least I feel, it is a good chance that we will see attempts on that this upcoming week. I feel uh, it, it feels very ready to me. I mean, there could be a fun cut here that just lays it over over a week of nothing happening in Starbase with my voice in the background saying <laughs> it will be an interesting week, but um, you never know. <laughs> But yeah, it seems like Ship 24 might be in the spotlight this week, but there's also a potential for boosters moving. We saw them shuffling around some boosters yesterday and booster eight kind of peeking out. So we will see what happens on the booster front. But for me, it right now looks more like they will roll out booster eight maybe for like some pressure cryo testing at some point uh, before booster seven leaves again in whenever that might happen. But that's, the, I think, the overview of the vehicles right now. Yeah, and uh, we've already getting questions, of course, but uh, we'll be keeping an eye on the Starship testing down in Starbase. Obviously, Starbase 24-7 for those when we are not live for a specific testing event, but we'll also continue to bring up uh, more specific uh, coverage for big tests. And uh, I'm thinking we'll go ahead and just get started into some questions here because I'm sure chat has plenty. Um, first question, do we think that Booster 8 is going to roll out before Booster 7 returns to the launch site? What's our, what's our predictions there? 
Um, I mean, that hedges on a lot of things. First off, booster eight readiness. It looks mm -hmm. like it's getting pretty close to ready for initial testing, but also what's the timeline in booster seven repairs? We don't really know any of that. Um, booster seven, we don't even know the, the status of booster seven, really. We've seen them take Raptors off booster seven. Maybe they're doing repairs. Maybe they're still like knee deep in figuring out what happened. Um, I would bet booster eight, honestly, because that's more of like a linear, just continuing on. Booster seven's a lot more in flux, I guess you could sure. say. Adrian, any thoughts? Yeah, I think it will. I, based on like the reshuffling and how the, how the booster eight was moved, and I don't know. It feels to me, and also the theory, the structural test stand would now be free again. Um, mm. I, it just feels to me that booster eight might go first for like pressure cryo I'm, I'm stating here it will go out probably without raptors it will be right. just pressure testing and then when you roll that back you then can really put booster seven if you if if that is still a plan and if they're moving on with that then they can put that through its campaign that's and, my expectation right now yeah so worth stressing here that the booster eight when booster eight rolls out we're not even expecting it to have raptors yet and so this is not an indication that Booster 8 has like passed Booster 7 as far as flight position and Booster 8's going to fly first. It's rolling out for testing that Booster 7 completed forever ago, right? Yeah, it's it, Booster 7 actually was in the same position about like a month or two ago, I think. It rolls out without Raptors, mm -hmm. um, missing a few things like certain covers, um, some piping, things like that. But it's basically just ready for tank testing. Can the tanks withstand pressure? That's all that they're testing. Um, and then after that's completed, they'll take it off the stand, roll it back, attach the Raptors, put on all the covers that they need, all the thermal protection, any extra piping, any extra equipment, the grid fins and all that fun stuff. So Booster 8 right now is kind of in a bare minimum test the tanks configuration. Yeah. Just to follow up on that, if we look at the timeline of Booster 7, it started cryo testing on April 4. So that's... And it, it that that testing took about from that rollback it took about two weeks, uh, which is a very funny number at this point uh, regarding <laughs> stories. And uh, it seems like from from so from the cryo first cryo to the accident of booster seven, uh, that was from April fourth to July eleven, so two and a half months ish, two two months. So booster eight is still a good chunk behind Booster 7. Booster 7 is way... The question now is which test Booster 7 has to do once it is repaired. That's the other question. We don't have any insight. But, um, yeah. 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 For all we know, they could be starting from scratch. They might have to go back to the structural test stand, cryo test there, then roll back for engines. We, or For all we know, they could just straight up roll out with engines and thermal protection installed and say, all right, cryo test static fire tomorrow. <laughs> you know? <laughs> SpaceX is the wild card there. But yeah, so no real updates as to them changing the vehicles assigned to the first orbital flight. Um, but we'll be watching for Booster 8 to conduct its own testing because that will at least give us an indicator as how quickly after the first flight, the second flight could go, right? Um, so that dual flow kind of situation is definitely worth watching. There's also been a lot of progress on Shift 25 uh, getting ready to finish deck and things like that. And so um, that's the other vehicle we'll start to keep an eye on uh, shortly as well. Uh, I'll keep some questions coming. Uh, actually, really quick, uh, we had a new Capcom member, a name I have no idea how to pronounce, but uh, thank you so much for joining the membership, uh, Regal maybe, uh, on the Capcom membership, appreciate that. Stefan asking if Shift24 could hop by flapping its flaps. I don't think that's how that works, but I appreciate the super chat. Uh, and then Mugzul is asking if Crane X is going to order any more cranes soon. Um, I think I think they've got the cranes they need now. I, <laughs> I think we're good. The chopsticks are pretty uh, well operational now at this point too, actually. But uh, um, yeah, I don't know. I think it's um, I think it, it's good to see that there's been other progress on the ground support side too. We've seen the chopsticks lift both a booster and a ship now. Hopefully that'll be the expectation for future vehicles to go to the launch mount. Um, do we have any other updates as far as like the tank farm or other ground support lines and things about their readiness to support an orbital attempt? I think they're getting closer and closer to it. I mean, I think the first major 
indicator that the tank farm is ready or almost ready for an orbital flight will be a static fire test because sure. you need to load liquid methane in the vehicle and liquid oxygen and in order to load those you need to have your ground infrastructure ready um so i think once we have a static fire or at least a wet dress rehearsal it'll be a good indicator of okay they are very close on the ground support side to being ready for an orbital flight and that's been the big kind of roadblock here for an orbital flight has been the ground support um we've seen that there may have been issues with the tank farm they've had to replace some tanks um the the tower and the launch mount took forever to get done so it's great to see everything kind of finally coming together to have some uh booster testing that isn't just cryogenic proofing so to be fair, they also don't have a ready vehicle. Like, just right, I, I, yeah. I agree with the GSE is uh, one of the roadblocks. But to be like, if you gave SpaceX a functional GSE today that perfectly could support everything, yep. they wouldn't have a ready vehicle. Right. Yeah. They don't have a single flight ready vehicle, it, booster or ship. So. Yep. Right. All right. Uh, more questions. Uh, Tony asking which ship would be the first to use the new E dome design. That we saw them testing before. Do we have any idea when there's going to be some sort of design upgrade on the ship or booster? I guess. Uh, I there's really no indication, honestly. It's the same. Don't you love just asking these guys to wildly speculate? It's fantastic. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> it's just throwing us into the ring. Fight, <laughs> but I, I mean, yeah, it's the same with the when we saw it was SN seven point two like two years ago with um the three millimeter stainless steel tanks. Where are those, you know? I, I think E-Dome is more just like, okay, we think that this could be useful. Let's just test it now, and then we'll get to it in the future. Because as of right now, if they're just trying to get a vehicle that can go to orbit, I think that's the main priority. And making any big changes to your vehicle's construction is gonna slow you down, make it more complicated. You have to retest things. So if I had to put a number to it, maybe like SN27 at the earliest. Honestly, they're probably going to want to get like a few ships that are the same configuration as Ship 24, just to have backups. And then from there, you start to modify it, perfect it a little bit, trim the weight down, you know? It always also assumes that they will implement, because they could also be the sure. case that a test doesn't work and something is not fulfilling the expectations Absolutely. and they just come to the computer like if they were sure they want to implement this they wouldn't test it mm -hmm. like Fair. yeah so, so uh it could also be the case that they're like nah that doesn't work yep exactly uh we're watching some footage of the flap testing that they did this week and i want to ask this question um are the flaps hydraulic or electric actuated do we know they are electric so they use um tesla model 3 rear motors huh. um, uh, I, I don't even remember where I hear that, but yeah. So they use Tesla batteries, which are in the engine section, I think. They're kind of like mounted on the inside, um, and those power the Tesla motors in each um, flap. So yeah, those things have a lot of torque behind them, that's for sure. Gotcha. Just a couple more questions here. Um, first of all, uh, Uranium wants to know if Starship could launch from Boca and then land the booster downrange in Florida. The booster will not go far enough downrange to land in Florida, first of all. It wouldn't reach. And then second of all, you would have to overfly the entire, all the rest of Florida, which is a bad idea, um, especially with a propellant vehicle or fueled vehicle. And so the booster will be conducting maybe downrange landings at some point, but the baseline architecture is like return to launch site, catch at the tower landings. Watch the um, first 40 minutes of the stream to get our detailed opinions about flying rocket stages above, above <laughs> our <flying laughs> area. Very true. Oh. Um, and then, Joseph, any progress towards FAA orbital launch approval? Will we see any milestones, or will it kind of all of a sudden be granted? Well, I guess we don't know for absolutely certain whether we could hear word of any progress. My opinion is that it will be the latter. Like, all of a sudden, they will just have a launch license. Yeah. And that's not super uncommon either. I mean, like, a couple... I remember, like... Uh, the Astra is the one that comes to mind, but like, though they when they finished their static fire test, they said we're waiting for the FAA launch license, and the license was approved like that either like the day before launch. That's not uncommon. Other private providers have done the same thing too, um, and so that's not like the SpaceX will be in the know of like when a launch license might be closed. The FAA will be keeping them updated on that. It just might not be public information. All right. Um, that is, uh, let's see, one more question here. Um, Steve, how is hydraulic and electrical power transferred from the tower to the chopsticks? 
I guess how I guess um, it's asking how the chopsticks are actuated, maybe. Uh, no, I think they're saying like how do they power the chopsticks? So what they do, they have a cable chain going up the side of the tower, which is basically uh, a big like kind of I don't know how to really describe it. I have it on my 3D printer. I'm not bringing my printer up to show you, um, <laughs> but it's basically just like a kind of like a cable tray, like you know, like a cable tray that hangs from a ceiling that you have like all your wires in, except it can fold. So what they do, it, it's a very, very long cable tray, and it just folds or unfolds as the, the chopsticks go up the tower. So it'll kind of like unfold to fall the sticks down, fold to follow them up. Um, that's basically how they do it. There you go. All right. Um, I think that wraps up the majority of the questions here. I know there are always more, but we are coming up on the end of the show here. Um, if you have more questions, we're all on Twitter. And I highly recommend sending us questions on Twitter. We'd love to discuss more on that front, as always, whenever we can't get to all the questions. Um, but I do want to offer some new content for the NASA Spaceflight YouTube channel. We have just released a new feature video um, that answers a question that we get on like every single launch live stream ever on NASA Spaceflight. If you have ever wondered what the four towers are for, we now have a fully in-depth video talking to a bunch of people at a bunch of different agencies and companies about lightning protection systems. And uh, I highly recommend checking out that video. Just go in live on the NASA Spaceflight channel. And if you too would like to ask people what the four towers are for and show everyone your appreciation for the lightning protection system. There's also a new piece of merch to go along with the video. There is four towers merch. Now you can get it on a shirt. And I believe I saw a mug was the other thing we've got it on. Um, if you two are tired of us talking about the four towers, you can voice your displeasure with the shirt. Um, but uh, again, the, short, the shop is a great way to support what we do at NASA Space Flight. It allows us to keep improving our coverage. You all know the drill. Um, all of you who send support on the YouTube channel as well, same thing. Thank you all so much for everything you do to support what we do. And we're glad that we were able to share all of our coverage and exciting stuff about space with you all. Um, so if you want to support us, check out the new merch on the NASA Space Flight store. There's also, of course, those new metal prints that are still out there. Um, there's the Moon to Mars Starship merch is up there. Um, tons of really good stuff. We're always adding to the store all the time. Um, so definitely go ahead and check it out. Um, I do want to thank everyone who tuned in and sent in super chats and questions and chat for today's stream um, and tunes into all the episodes of NASA Space Flight Live. Of course, I want to give a big thank you to our YouTube members who go above and beyond with their support, those launch directors and flight engineers. Really just a huge, generous amount of support um, that really goes above and beyond um, anything we could ever ask for. So thank you so much. Um, I think that will do it for this week of Spaceflight News. Stay tuned. We've got a busy week for launches this week. We've got two launches from here in Florida on Thursday, so stay tuned for the live coverage of that, as well as anything that goes on in Starbase, of course, um, and any other space news that comes up throughout the week. Check us out here on the YouTube channel and on NASASpaceFlight.com. Ian Atkinson, writer, reporter, editor, commentator, voiceover so person things. so many things here at that space <laughs> these days so ian thank you so much for all of your work and thank you for tuning on today it was Coming fun to today. be here fun little stream and uh, Adrian Bile, also a man of many hats here at NASA Space Flight, but today one of our NASA Space Flight Live experts Adrian thank you so much for hopping on thanks for having me and also thanks to our chat mods at being chat uh, happy as always Yes, of course. And of course, uh, in addition to our moderators, we also have Michael Baylor in the background, pushing buttons, pulling levers. You all know the drill. Uh, Michael, thank you for everything you did for today. Uh, and thank you all for tuning in. My name is Thomas Burkhart for NASA Space Flight signing off. We will see you next time.